Our God is still on his throne and ruling the affairs of man. Even as he does not change, his truths have not changed. Thankfully, God still has a people which proclaim that old-time religion setting forth his sovereignty and the old paths of truth where we can find rest for our souls. Welcome to Word of Sovereign Grace, a ministry of Paradise Primitive Baptist Church in Arlington, Texas. Get your Bible, call your friends, and sit back as we open the King James Scriptures to explore the glorious Word of Sovereign Grace. Here's this week's message. Thankful for the opportunity to be in the house of the Lord this morning. I uh, believe that we do have much to be thankful for. We have life and breath. We have redemption through Christ. We have His Word of truth. We have the church. Uh, these things are not to be taken lightly. Uh, our blessings, I, I seriously doubt that we could count them all. But you know, our nature oftentimes causes us to focus on our worries and our circumstances. He says in one place that the fowl of the air, they don't sow, they don't reap, they don't gather into barns, but yet your Heavenly Father feeds them. And He'll take care. It's about seeking first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. Uh is the priority that should be the priority in our life first and foremost what the Lord expects of us is very very reasonable he says present your bodies a living sacrifice holy and acceptable unto God which is your reasonable service so what the Lord expects from us is very reasonable and it's not unreasonable uh, we're to present ourselves at this place for a few hours every week and but it doesn't stop there of course we know that um, to give God lip service would say that we would just come here and then go out and leave here and live any way that we wanted to or any way or live the way of the world um, I had to retract that a little bit because I am trying to live the way that I want to I want to try to serve the Lord and why do I want to serve the Lord uh, I think that we understand it's from a motive of gratitude and thankfulness for how great things that God has done for us. I'm, I'm always reminded of that wild Gadarean that was that one that was among the tombs, and he was naked, and and uh, no man could, he couldn't be bound with fetters or chains. And when the Lord came to him, that man had a legion of devils in him. The Lord cast him out. And afterwards, when the people of the city came, they saw that man sitting and clothed and in his right mind. What a blessing that is to know that to be touched by the Master, that we can be sitting, clothed, and in our right mind. Because in a state of nature, the Scripture teaches that we were by nature children of wrath, even as others. In a state of nature... Had God left us in that condition, we certainly deserved eternal hell. And I'm one that believes that the, the redemption that Christ has wrought for His people certainly means something. If there are people out there that believe in no hell, and if Jesus didn't save you from hell, what did He save you from? I believe that it's a, it's a great redemption that Christ has wrought on the cross of Calvary for His people. And therefore, the, uh, I appreciate the salvation that Jesus finished on my behalf and on yours. Uh, he finished the work that God gave Him to do. He didn't leave anything left open to be filled in by you or I at some later date. He cried out on the cross, It is finished. And he says in John chapter 17, Father, I've finished the work which thou hast given me to do. Um, I've given eternal life to as many as thou hast given me. If you want to know the exact number that are going to live in heaven in immortal glory, and sometimes people ask those questions. Well, I wonder how many. Well, it's as many as were given to Christ in the covenant of grace before the foundation of the world. 
That's how many. Not not one less, not one more. So, we have a lot to be thankful for this morning. Uh, uh, we've been given a great responsibility. It's interesting, I was thinking this past week about the things that Jesus taught. And I was wondering, do uh, you think the Pharisees would have invited him to come and speak at their meeting? <laughs> what about Jeremiah? You remember Jeremiah is re- referred to as the weeping prophet. Jeremiah preached and had a message. He wasn't tickling ears. He was getting on toes and he was telling God's people what they needed to hear, not what they wanted to hear. And because of that, Jeremiah was always in trouble. And during his ministry, he had one companion, and that was uh, Baruch, the scribe, if I understand the story correctly. Uh, That must have been a very lonely place to be, having a message and sounding a message, and no one wants to hear it. It it almost seems like that's the way it is with the doctrines of grace. Nowadays that no one wants to hear it. Um, They don't don't have an understanding that it's a very comforting uh, truth and reality that we're saved by grace apart from our works. I can think of nothing else that gives me more comfort to know that my eternal destiny is in the finished work of Jesus Christ and is not dependent upon my good works. Now, as I said, I believe that we work, but we work, the reason we work is not so that we can get our names pinned in the Lamb's Book of Life. It's because we love the Lord, because we see how great things that He's done for us. We love Him, the Scripture says, because He first loved us. Now, we can't really comprehend the depth of this love. At least I can't. I become... I become lost in the greatness and the grandeur of God when I consider such a, such an act of love to condescend and become a man and take upon himself the sin of ungodly people, of, of his enemies. The scripture says that Christ died for us. We were his while we were his enemies. Now, are any of you willing to do that for your enemies? You know, the Scripture does teach us that we're to love our enemies. That's one of the supreme challenges that we have in this this life in which we live. You know, not only, he says, the Lord says, sinners love other sinners. He says, what thank have you, or what's the big deal about that? If you love them which love you, what's the big deal? Uh, Everybody does that. But we're taught to even love our enemies, to do good uh, to those uh, that... uh, hate us and to pray for those that despitefully use us and persecute us. He said that you may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. Now that doesn't mean so that you become a child of God but so that it becomes manifest or made known that you're a child of God because in one place he says by this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you have love one to another. So that, that indeed is our supreme challenge is to to love and learn to love our enemies. And I have to confess that I fall short. We're, we're depressed toward the mark of the high calling of God which is in Christ Jesus. And no, I don't think that we'll ever attain to that in this life, at least not until our bodies are changed and fashioned like unto His glorious body will we, will we be able to attain to that mark. That means a mark of sinless perfection. And what does it mean to sin? Uh, To sin, it means to miss the mark. So we are depressed toward the mark and not we don't want to miss the mark. We want our eye to be single, focused upon the Lord, and and living a life of sanctification. Now, I I know that a lot a lot of times people they think about sanctification. What what a Boring doctrine, what, you know, how dry is that teaching? But it's basically saying that I'm taking the things that the Lord has told me to do and applying them in my life. It's called the doctrine of practical godliness. And if we don't do the things, 
He says in one place, Why call ye me Lord and do not the things that I say? Why do we call Him Lord if we don't do the things that He says? We need to, take the th- we need to be hearers and doers of God's Word. You've heard me many times talk about how that James says it's like a man that looks in a mirror or a woman that looks in a mirror. You see the changes and the corrections that need to be made and you turn around and go your way without making them. You've deceived yourself, the Scripture says. It didn't say the devil deceived you. You deceived yourselves. So we, we need to look into the perfect law of liberty. And that's one of the uncomfortable things about this book is the Lord tells it like it is. That, that may be... Uh, he preached all the counsel of God. He just didn't preach one thing. And as a matter of fact, he probably taught more about hell than he did about heaven. So do you think that that someone uh, like that today would be invited to preach at some of our meetings? Um, I, I know from experience, if you take a position to preach the hard things, to preach uh, the truth as it is in Christ Jesus... And, and you believe the Word and you make application of the Word in your life, your world gets smaller and smaller. The, the people that, that you can have common interest with become smaller and smaller. Brother Royce can attest to this. We've talked about it before. You believe in the things that this book teaches, you're going to lose friends. Uh, and one of, the, one of the things that, that I know that is much misunderstood is the doctrine of predestination. Some people hear that and they shudder. That's because it's been misaligned by the world. Uh, in most seminaries, that when you go to seminary, when they get to Romans chapter 8, they, miss, they either skip over it or they misalign it. And I know for a fact, I've talked to professors, and I've even seen some of the online courses that the seminaries offer. They do it a great injustice, all because they don't understand it. Uh, we had, a, we had a visitor last week that believed in, um, that didn't have a, a, a good understanding of uh, predestination. They, they hold to what we term absolute predestination. And we talked about it, and I, I told her that we don't believe that because absolute predestination negates the responsibility of man. If there's anything that I understand, there's, a, there's much of this Word that we, that we believe in that teaches that we have to be responsible to God. We're responsible to God for a lot of things, just like our children are responsible to us. But we know that one thing that we're not responsible for is becoming children. But we're responsible for being obedient children. Uh, no, predestination does not include what? He says, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate. Not what God foreknew, but whom he foreknew. Now, there is a doctrine of predetermination. Uh, and those things are, are the things that the, where the Scripture will not be broken. And those are the things that deal specifically, I believe, with the coming of Christ and of Him redeeming all the steps that are necessary for Him to redeem His people. And that's where I believe that it stops. It, uh, the, I would be scared too of the doctrine of absolute predestination that would actually make God the author of sin, that when someone sins, well, God predestined it, I must, you know, it must be okay. They call it the I can't help it doctrine. Well, we can help it, brothers and sisters. We have no excuse. Uh, the Scripture teaches, "For whom the Lord loves, He chastens. He chastens His He chastens His, his people." And He says, "If you're without chastisement, then your bastards are not sons." Okay, for whom the Lord loves, He chastens. So, yes, we we are to be responsible. We have responsibility. This this Bible teaches it. And I believe that we can reconcile the will, the, the will of man and the sovereignty of God. And the sovereignty of God means that God is the potter, we're the clay. He can do whatever He desires. He doesn't have to ask you anything, nor does He have to ask me. All right? He is God, and we are worms. And that's what the Scripture says. We are but worms in His sight. 
He is the sovereign of the universe. He doesn't. Uh, he doeth according to his will among the armies of heaven and the inhabitants of the earth. And none can stay his hand or say unto him, What doest thou? Yes, God performs his will. Now, we have to understand, I know I'm getting, uh, I'm creating a very broad um, message and I hope I'll be able to rein it back in. But we know that the will of God, come, there are three aspects to the will of God. There's the decreed will that God determined that, that certain persons and certain things would take place. Known unto God are all his works from the foundation of the world. Uh, and, and there's other texts that speak to that. Uh, so there's the things that God decreed that will come to pass. Okay, now I say in the main, most of those deal with the things that were necessary to accomplish the redemption of God's people. Uh, then there's also the suffering will of God. When we think about the evil and the sin that takes place in this life, God suffers it to take place. I used to call uh, call that the permissive will, or God permits it. But the suffering will of God is more in line, uh, a more scriptural term for that. And why God does it, we may not understand in this lifetime. But we know that He is able to overrule uh, sin for His own glory. Then there's also the will of God's command, and that's where the main of the Scripture teach us that we have to be obedient to the commands and the precepts of God. By the way, did you know you're commanded to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ? First uh, John chapter 3 tells you that very thing. That we're commanded to believe on the Lord, and we know that our belief... Uh, does not cause us to become born again, but our belief evidence is that we are born again. Uh, I, I know that uh, sometimes people ask, what is the main difference between what old Baptists believe and what other people believe? And if you had to give a short answer for that, is that the things that other orders believe are the cause of salvation, we believe are the evidences. Uh, in other words, the fruit we believe that belief is not the cause of getting born again, but belief is the evidence that we are born again. It's the fruit. Faith is a fruit of the Spirit. Uh, I, I've never once seen uh, this. I use this illustration all the time. I've never once seen an apple pop in the midair and a tree grow in under it. It just doesn't work that way. I know my brother-in-law over here. He's He's got a lot of trees going in his yard and he knows that's the way it works. You plant the, the, the tree or the seed and the tree comes up and later the, the fruit comes along. And we know that faith indeed is the fruit of the Spirit. Faith cannot be the cause. Faith, because he says in one place, pray for us that we might be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men for all men have not faith. But in another place he says, God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. And we have to learn to divide between uh, what the every and the alls in the scripture are talking about. <clears throat> when it says, when the train conductor, uh, when he yells, all aboard, who is he talking to? Is he talking to everyone in the train station or just those with tickets for, for that destination? Of course, you know, he, when he says all aboard, he's calling those that have tickets. Uh, for that. So he's not calling everyone that's in the train station. So anyway, I, I know that this, uh, the depth of this doctrine can become quite emotional when people think that it's unfair that God would choose some and not others. Uh, but he is God, Jesus said in one place, can I not do what I will with mine own? And absolutely he can. He is the potter where the clay, he says, cannot the potter make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor? Absolutely he can. He's God, he's just and right. He is God, his work, work is perfect, all his ways are, are, are ju just. Um, he is a rock, his work is perfect. Um, all his ways are judgment. A God of truth without iniquity, just and right is he. He is the God of all the earth. He shall do right. Now, we think about <clears throat> we think again about this doctrine of predestination. This simply defined it just means that your destination was determined beforehand. 
Every one of you did that this morning. You determined before you got, before you left the house that you were coming to this place. So there was some predestination that took place there, would it? Well, that's kind of simple, isn't it? God, but God determined before the world began that He would give a, a certain number of people to His Son. And those are the ones that Jesus came and bled and suffered and died for. Uh, that they might live with Him in heaven and immortal glory. Now, it's a number that's so great that no man can number it. Uh, he says that Jesus gave His life a ransom for many. And He also says that the children of God is, are as a multitude like the stars of heaven and as the sands by the seashore. Uh, uh, an innumerable host. A, people, a great number of people. And it was said to Rebekah... Uh, who married Isaac, and in Isaac shall I see be called. But it was said to Rebekah, be the mother of thousands of millions. So you do the math, that's at least three billion. And I, I don't know how, how many, but I know that it's going to be a great number. It's going to be a great number of people that are going to live in heaven and mortal glory, and they'll be to the praise and the honor and glory of God's grace and His mercy, and at the same time there will be some that will be to the praise of God's wrath and justice. I know that's hard for us. That's hard for us to understand. But, but Jesus taught it. He told those Pharisees in Matthew chapter 23, says, How shall you escape the damnation of hell? He wasn't giving them a formula to tell them how to do it. He was telling them there was no escape for them. He's God. I, can, I can't make a statement like that to any of you or anyone else. You know why? Because I'm not God. I've not looked on... A, 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 I didn't pen that book of life. I don't know everyone's name that's in there. Uh, but I believe that God does. No, we're not to judge. Um, like the thief on the cross, if someone would have seen him a few days before he was crucified, they may have judged this man and said, He's hellbound. Look at the way that the things that he's doing and the way that he's living. But we know that when he was hanging on the cross at one point, he was railing against Christ as the other thief was. And then something happened. Something happened to that man while he was hanging on the cross. And he had a change of heart. And he asked the Lord, he said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus told him, this day shalt thou be with me in paradise. I believe that God is able to change, uh, uh, regenerate and change a heart of stone and give someone a heart of flesh even on their deathbed. He's able to do it in an infant too. What is it said of Jeremiah? Before I formed thee in the womb, I knew thee. You know, let's, let's talk to some abortionists about some of these things. These people that claim to be Christians. Let's talk about some of this. John the Baptist was moved, uh, 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 born of the Spirit of God in his mother's womb. And when Elizabeth and Mary met together, the babe leaped for joy uh, because the Holy Ghost was in that was in John the Baptist. These people, they want to cheapen it and they want to call it a fetus. It's a child. It's a child of God. God is able in the womb, on the deathbed, to regenerate. He's not limited. He's not limited by man's ability or inability to carry the gospel to anyone. He is able, even at this instance, to speak life. John 5.25 says, For the hour is coming and now is, when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. You don't, don't need a preacher for that. Don't need the gospel for that. Because three verses later in John 5.28, he says, For the hour is coming in the which all that are in the grave shall hear His voice. Now they shall hear His voice. I want you to notice in, in John 5.25, The hour is coming and now is when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God. It didn't say they'll hear His words. They'll hear His voice. He speaks and they live. 
And if it takes the voice of the preacher to get you born again in John 5.25, it's going to take the voice of the preacher to get you out of the grave at the end of time. Huh. I'm not counting on that. <laughs> and I know you're not either. Because there's no man that has that power but the Lord. He is a resurrection and He is alive. Now if, it takes, if it takes a preacher to get you born again, it's going to take a preacher to get you out of the grave. But that's the God that we serve that's omnipresent. That means He's everywhere present and nowhere absent. That's the God that we serve. And the God that we serve is able to give you, each and every one of you, 100% of His intention. And everyone else at the same time. I believe that. He's omnipresent. He's everywhere present. He's nowhere absent. David says, if I ascend to the heavens, you're there. If I make my bed in hell, you're there. Wherever. God is everywhere present and nowhere absent. Um, that's why I like to remind the teenagers, God's always watching. You get together with some of your friends and they'll say, nobody can see what we're doing. That's the biggest lie the devil ever tells you that nobody ever sees God always sees what you're doing. He sees in secret. He sees in secret. When he, when he talks about giving alms or praying, you, you give your alms in secret, you pray in secret. God sees in secret. He rewards openly. Yes, God sees through the dark clouds. He that made the eye, can he not see? <laughs> That's the question. He that made the ear, can he not hear? Absolutely he can. So... We trust Him. The essence of this God that we serve, the Scripture says He's able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. The greatest thing that you can think of, God's, He's able to do exceeding abundantly above that. All that you ask or think. We can't comprehend. He says, now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. He's talking about the time when, we, when we're resurrected and we come into the fullness of His presence. Now we see through a glass dark. That's like trying, uh, trying to understand, even with the revelation that we have, that God has given us, God has revealed His Son to us. He's revealed Christ in our hearts even with the revelation that we have and the Word and the life that He gives we still see through a glass darkly. That's like driving down the interstate the other day a big long limousine came aside <laughs> and those dark glass that you, you just want to know who's in there, right? You automatically see a limousine you want to know who's in there. But you can't see because the glass is, you might see a a, a, a outline of an image of somebody in there moving around. That's about all you can see. And even with the revelation that we have, that's about all that we can see sometimes. I know the Scripture says this, the things that are revealed belong to us, and the secret things belong unto God. Uh, I'm not going to get in, I wouldn't get into talking about UFOs because you, the Bible doesn't talk about UFOs. Alright, there's a lot of, we can speculate about a lot of things, but I'm, I'm here to tell you this morning that the things that are in this book are enough to keep us busy all of our lives and then some. We don't need to, you know, know about UFOs and all that kind of stuff. I think those things are more of a distraction than they are anything else. But anyway... Let's just stick with the things that God has revealed and, and let's let the secret things belong to God. And, and, and by the way, the truth of God is revealed. It's not gained by a seminary education. And I don't believe that it's even gained by much study. Uh, I believe that it's revealed. We know that Jesus Himself is revealed to know... By the way, did you know that if you believe that Jesus Christ is God manifest in the flesh, that God revealed that to you? Uh, and if you understand the Scriptures, remember when the Lord was walking on the road with those to Emmaus? And later on in that text, He says, Then open He their understanding, that they might understand the Scriptures. 
If God doesn't open your understanding, you will have none. You will have no, or you will have a, uh, at best, um, an inconsistent, mixed up understanding uh, of the Word of God. Jesus said to the Lord in one place, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent and has revealed them unto babes. You see, it's revealed. The truth is revealed. And it's to the humble, and when he says revealed unto babe, to those that humble themselves, those of God's people that humble themselves, the Lord will reveal the truth to you. But it doesn't mean that you don't have to study. You do. You need to study. He says we need to um, be a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, putting place in their proper context. Now, the God that we serve is incomprehensible in this lifetime. Um, he's great. Uh, he's, he's grand. He's glorious. Uh, and our most intimate experience that we've ever had with Him in this life will not compare to what we have awaiting us. It will be so, so, so much greater. So we see that God doesn't pull any punches in His books. He tells us that we've been predestined uh, to be conformed to the image of His Son, and I find it to be one of the most comforting doctrines. And yet at the same time, I believe that there is a responsibility that we have as children of God. And I believe that once we're born of the Spirit of God, we have a free will. We can either serve the Lord or not. I don't recommend... The latter. I recommend that we serve the Lord. Remember, for whom the Lord loves, He chastens. We can decide who we want to serve, but we can't decide to become children of God any more than I or you decided to become children of your parents. I can't remember who it was. It may have been my sister that's sitting over here. One time we lived over in Sunrise. I think we lived over on the east side. And there was a little B and B, or no, that wasn't B and B. But there was a little grocery store there, and either you or Daryl or someone took me to the store with them and locked me in the phone booth. And it, they had the accordion style, the accordion style uh, doors where I couldn't reach the handle, and that was traumatic to me. Uh, I remember that. I can't remember back any further in my life. It wasn't you. It was probably Daryl. Uh, but that was traumatic to me. I guess he wanted to make sure I didn't run off while he was in the store buying whatever mom sent him to buy. But I remember that. Probably about two and a half, three years old. But you know what? I was alive prior to that. I was alive prior to that time. So, and I, I suggest to you that it's the same way in your spiritual life that you're alive prior to uh, one day you may find yourself having a desire to pray you have a desire to read the word of God you have a desire to go to church you have a desire to know more about God well you know what the scripture will teach that you were alive sometime prior to that and those things are evidencing that you have spiritual life because the natural man receiveth not the things of the spirit of God Neither can he know them. They're foolishness unto him. He says they're spiritually discerned. The things of God are spiritually discerned. And no man knows the things of the Spirit save the Spirit of God. And if God gives us His Spirit, then we can know the things of the Spirit. Now, I was alive prior to that time. Now, it could be some people may be alive, born of the Spirit of God for some good time. And others, it may just be a few minutes. I, I don't know. John 3, 8 says, The wind blows where it listeth. Thou hearest the sound thereof, but cannot tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth. And so is everyone that's born of the Spirit of God. In other words, I can look out and I can see the wind. No, I can't see the wind. I can see the trees moving back and forth, which is evidence that the wind is blowing through them. And that is, but I don't know. You don't know when you were born again. 
I, I had, in another order I used to belong to, they told me, you know, on this day when, when you accepted Christ and you got baptized, you got born again. Well, wait a minute. John 3 8 says, I can't know. The wind blows where it pleases. You can hear the sound of it, but you can't tell where it comes from and where it goes. And he says, and so is everyone that's born of the Spirit of God. Kind of. Now, what I can remember is the day of my conversion. I can remember that. There's a difference between becoming a son of God and becoming a disciple of Christ. All of God's people at one point or sometime in their life, that Paul says, when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by His grace, when it pleased God, when it pleases God, will be born of the Spirit of God. Not until. Not until. We don't know. We don't know what if some people I remember from a young age calling out to God. I didn't have a lot of understanding. Uh, my mother took us to church a few times when I was young, and uh, I remember running back and forth on the pews. But there was a time that she had to take work. And we didn't get to go to church. But I remember, I remember thinking about God when I was very young and calling out and asking for help. I didn't have any details. That, that's an amazing thing to think about when you consider that our God is able to sovereignly quicken and make alive. You hath He quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. He's able to make alive and quicken. Uh, he's not restrained. I think of, about Helen Keller. You remember her story? Born deaf, dumb, and blind. And finally, and, and later on in her years, when they learned how to communicate with her, they decided, well, it's time we got a preacher over here to her to get her saved. <laughs> well, they started communicating with her, and she says, oh, I already knew him. I just didn't know his name. That's the God that we serve. He's able to reach to the utmost. The deaf, the dumb, the blind, the, the, the retarded or the mentally challenged, those on desert islands, those never had an opportunity to hear the gospel. The good news. Indeed, it's good news to know that Jesus Christ died for you in your room instead and and bore the, uh, the punishment of your, that you deserved on account of your sin. That's good news that needs to be published. And we need to make disciples of God's people. But we can't make children. The purpose of the Gospel is not to make children. It's to feed the people that God has created. For we are His workmanship in Christ Jesus, created unto good works with God as before ordained that we should walk in them. We are His workmanship. And if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. I ran across some not too long ago that were really taken when the Lord says, go and preach the gospel to every creature. They were, they were taking that. They were running at the seed. And then the, here's this guy got filling himself underwater in his scuba equipment preaching to the dolphins. That's not what the Lord intended. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. That's the creature that, that the Apostle Paul said it. the gospel went into all the world. He had preached the gospel to every creature which is under heaven. Paul said he did it. Colossians 1.23 He fulfilled that command. He did it. Now, we're to preach. Um, and we're to make disciples. And we're to baptize and we're to walk in the kingdom of God. And we're to, we're to love one another. And <clears throat> we're to assemble together and wash one another's feet. And, and uh, pray that the Lord would meet us in these, in these places. And that He would prepare a table for us. That we can eat and drink in His kingdom. No, but we don't make ourselves children. I, I know I've been scattered. <laughs> 
But I find the doctrine of predestination and the sovereignty of God to be a most comforting doctrine. God finished it because when the light of the Holy Spirit shines in my heart and I see the, the depth, I don't see the full depth. I don't think we ever want to see the full depth of our depravity. But God shows us just enough to know that we've sinned against Him, that we're worthy of hell, and if it were not for the mercy and the grace of God, we'd all be lost. Jesus did it. He trod the wine press alone. He didn't say, well, you know, we've got to pay for this sin. Why don't you come get in here with me and help me press out these grapes of the wrath of God. He went alone. He went alone. There was the Lord looked. Him, the Lord looked down from heaven among the children of men to see if there's any that understood, uh, and there, if there's any that were seeking after God. He said there were none. They had all gone astray. There were none unprofitable. There were none good. That's why the Lord came in the first place, because there were none of us that could save Himself or save anyone else. But you had God manifest in the flesh, born of a virgin. Now, a lot of people, they don't teach that anymore. The Holy Ghost overshadowed Mary. She was born of a virgin. That's a miracle. You you look back, you look at... Abraham, you look at uh, Samson uh, birth, you look at Samuel's birth, you look at all, you look, there's so many, uh, Zacharias and John the Baptist, they were well among past childbearing, all these miraculous births pointing to this one miraculous births of all, that the Lord, that God would be, uh, would, uh, condescend and he would be born in, uh, in the womb of Mary a virgin and never known a man now I know some of the other translations they, they change that word virgin to young, child, uh, young woman but that, that just really waters it down doesn't it I believe in the miraculous virgin birth just not as I believe that God spoke the world into existence okay In the the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, got time, space, and matter. I believe that God did that in an instant. He spoke it, and He he, uh, completed the creation in six literal days, six 24-hour days. And I believe that God flooded the world, and I, I believe that God parted the Red Sea, and I believe that God brought those Hebrew children out of that fiery furnace. And I believe that God uh, uh, licked up that sacrifice of Elijah after he had watered it down with many barrels of water. I believe what the, what the Word of God says. And I believe that Jesus was born of a virgin. And I believe that He came to save us. You know what that angel told Mary? Thou shalt call His name Jesus, for He shall save His people from their sins. didn't say... He's going to give it a good try. He's going to, you know, he'll give it a whirl and see what happens. No, he shall save his people. And he did. I believe that he did. John, John chapter 17 again. Father, all, uh, let me go get that so I don't mess it up. I just now realize I haven't taken the text. Should I do that? These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven. And by the way, this is the Lord's Prayer in John chapter 17. It's not found in Matthew chapter 5 or 6. These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify thy Son, that thy Son may also glorify thee, as thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. Now you want to take up a good study, take that phrase, as many as, and chase that down. <laughs> uh, John said in the book of Revelation, the Lord said, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. 
Why didn't he say that he rebuked and chastened everyone? But he says, as many as. So, as thou hast given him power over flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. Those are the ones that are going to live in heaven and immortal glory. So the $64,000 question now becomes not have you accepted Christ, but rather has Christ accepted you. Ephesians 1.6 I'm going to get that. I quote this all the time. Ephesians chapter 1. Let's start verse 4. According as He has chosen us in Him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to Himself according to the good pleasure of His will to the praise of the glory of His grace, wherein He hath made us accepted in the Beloved. So right there it's telling us that Christ, because we were chosen in, uh, before the foundation of the world, that Christ has accepted us. So the question is now, what do we do? If, if you feel yourself to be a sinner not worthy of the least of God's blessing, it's an evidence that you're one of His because He says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Uh, Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Those that are mourning on account of their sin. What, are they, what do you need to do? You need to make your calling and election sure. By taking up your cross following Christ and being baptized and becoming a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what we're called upon to do. We're to put on Christ. Um, we're to sanctify ourselves from this world, set ourselves apart, and we wait on the Lord. Um, I know I've been scattered, uh, but nonetheless, it is what it is. Think about these things. There's much more that could be said, uh, obviously. We believe in preaching all the counsel of God, not just the things that people like to hear. I, like I say, I'm convinced that, um, that the Lord probably would not be invited into some churches to preach because of the things that He taught. But we need to, we need to preach the things that you need, not what you want. And Paul asks this question in one place. He says, Am I become your enemy because I tell you the truth? Thank you all for your good attention as we stand and sing a suitable hymn. One or more has a desire to out this body. This will be your opportunity. Word of Sovereign Grace, a ministry of Paradise Primitive Baptist Church in Arlington, Texas. Paradise Primitive Baptist Church is located at 5300 Mansfield Road in Arlington, Texas. Services begin at 1030 each Sunday morning plan to come and worship with us. To find out more about Paradise Primitive Baptist Church, visit www.paradisepbc.org. Be sure to visit our website for articles, video, and audio sermons, as well as biblical answers to your questions. Thanks for watching, and be sure to join us again next week. May God richly bless you.